Hallelujah. I wonder if there's anybody here today who wants to encounter a very intimate experience with Jesus right now in this moment. As this atmosphere has been set by Elevate, I want you to know that the Lord is here to encounter you. And when you speak the name of Jesus, he responds. Hallelujah. The name of Jesus cannot be mentioned without there first being a stirring. You cannot mention the name of Jesus and not experience him. Hallelujah. So why don't you just experience him right now in this moment. In this atmosphere, it is so ripe. Hallelujah. 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 Jesus. Jesus, we love you. <laughs> God, we love you. Hallelujah. We adore you, Master. We thank you that you are here that you've been here all along. You've been waiting for us. Hallelujah. And we come this morning just to encounter you in a very real way. A way unlike any other we have encountered before. Abide with us, Father. Mando roboko soto, maliade be sete makondo robasa. Hallelujah, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. We thank you, Jesus, because there is no other name under heaven whereby we can be saved. Your name is a strong tower. And the righteous runs to it and are saved. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Elevate. Hallelujah. Thank you, Elevate. Hallelujah. Thank you. You may take your seats in the presence of the Lord if you can. Amen. What an amazing presence. I really don't know that I need to say anything this morning because the presence of the Lord is so rich here. And I believe that the Lord has already started the work of engagement with everybody that has come to meet him and to experience him. Amen. And in as much as the presence of the Holy Spirit is also here, I want to acknowledge in his absence the head of the Supernatural Life Center Ministries, Fellowship of Supernatural Life Ministries, Apostle Bible Davis, who is now with us this morning. He sends his greetings to the household of faith and to each and every one here today. We thank God for his life and we thank God for the work and the commission and the mandate that he has given our apostle in this season. Hallelujah. We honor our apostle in his absence. And we want to acknowledge the presence of our first lady, Prophetess Rebecca Bible Davids. Hallelujah. Amen. Prophetess, we honor you. I will never stand in this pulpit and not recognize the leadership of our ministry. 
Hallelujah. I owe so much to this awesome and fantastic duo. My apostle and my prophetess, I honor you, woman of God. Amen. I also want to greet all of the pastors and the deaconesses, our evangelist ministers, all of you who are here in this house this morning. Our praise and worship team, Elevate, you all have done such a fantastic job. Minister Ruth, we honor you too this morning for preparing the atmosphere. Amen. Thank you so much. I ordinarily would sit off to the side and bask in the glory, and I kind of wanted to do that today when I felt the peculiar anointing come down. And then I remember what the Lord laid on my heart uh, last night, and it really is in alignment with the experience that we have already had to date. You see, Jesus came long before many of you arrived into this building waiting for you. He was always here. He was always here. And sometimes what needs to happen, in fact, not sometimes, but all the time, what needs to happen is that we have to exercise our faith and demonstrate a need for the presence and the encounter of Jesus Christ. So he comes well ahead of our arrival with the expectation that he is going to bless. Amen? So you've come already into a good thing. You've come already into an atmosphere that's been prepared and set for miracles. Hallelujah. And so I want you to know that as we proceed further and into the word of God, there's a very specific message to somebody here this morning. I don't know who it is. I really don't. I was praying last night or this morning, and as I was putting pen to paper, I couldn't help but to say, my God, who is this for, Lord? We may be few in number in this place today because of social distancing and our COVID guidelines and all that, and that's fine. But we are a vast army. Hallelujah. We are a vast army. And so I want everybody to know, and those of you who are viewing on our social media platforms and our, on our Zoom call, that the Lord had purposed within himself to meet you at the very point of your need today. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I want you to know that the Lord had purposed within himself to meet you at the point of your need. You are his primary assignment. Amen. In a world of shifting priorities and complexities and in a world in which from one day to the next, we are hearing news that causes our very heart to fail in some cases. I want to remind you that you are the priority of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I would like for you to join with me as we enter into, for the next few minutes, a very familiar passage of Scripture. St. John's chapter 4, verses 1 to 15. And I will be reading from the New King James Version, and I'd ask that you would follow along prayerfully. Hallelujah. St. John chapter 4, verses 1 to 15. Amen. Amen. I have acknowledged everybody here today, but I had failed to acknowledge my wife. I pray that your graces will be extended to me when we leave this place today. My I am better. I you. Thank you, prophetess. I need that prayer. <laughs> I am who I am because my wife makes me who I am. She supports me. She loves me. And you know, when I got the call that I would be delivering the word this morning, I had forged, I set aside some time to spend with her last night. 
and then I got a, a message. <laughs> I got a phone call. You see, you cannot be in Supernatural Life Center and not be prepared. Our apostle has told us that. And I turned to my wife and I said, I'm sorry. I got to retreat into the presence of the Lord. So, babe, I love you and I appreciate you and I honor you and I thank you for being patient with me. Our best days are yet ahead of us. Amen. So, St. John chapter 4, verse 1 of 15 reads, new, in the New King James Version, Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize, but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. But he needed to go through Samaria. I want you to Bear that in mind. Highlight that if you can. But he needed to go through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar. I want you to highlight that too. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar. Near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Hallelujah. Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink of me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans, Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. Hallelujah. Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst and not come here to draw. Hallelujah. In this particular passage of scripture, we embark on a journey with Jesus and his disciples as the setting is in Judea. At the time that this, the scripture was recorded, there was quite a, a stir in Judea because Jesus was performing miracles, signs and wonders in great numbers. And those miracles caused a reciprocal response by those who saw them and witnessed the miracles. And that led to a great revival in the region, so much so that the disciples began to baptize a great many number of individuals who believed on Jesus, who confessed him to be Lord and Savior. Amen? Hallelujah. So when the word of Jesus' notoriety got around to the Pharisees, it caused a shift. 
that caused the shift. The Pharisees purpose within themselves, well, we got to figure out what this Jesus is all about. They were a very peculiar set of people. See, they were very legalistic. They had a, a, a determination to present an external appearance of righteousness and sanctification mixed in their Judaic values with the law and they themselves not abide by the law. Jesus, in fact, had many of interactions and encounters with the Pharisees. And their primary purpose and, 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 and assignment at that time was to antagonize the work of Jesus and the mandate that he had had to fulfill not only in Judea, but in the region surrounding Judea. So Jesus, being God, knowing this, realized that the assignment that he was on in Judea was complete. And so he said to his disciples, come, finish baptizing those that are lined up. We're going to uh, be on our journey because I must need to go to Samaria. Hallelujah. So Jesus and his disciples left Judea and headed, in fact, they were heading to Galilee to the north. But in order for them to get to Galilee, they had to go through Samaria. And isn't it amazing that as we look at the very timing of Jesus' departure from Judea, that there was an immediate recognition that his assignment, he knew that his assignment was done. So he didn't linger around there longer than he had to. He had to transition from Judea to the next level, which took him into Samaria and then ultimately into Galilee. That was a very valuable lesson for me. When I went through the scriptures, I realized that when God gives you a specific assignment and you have delivered that assignment, you don't have to linger around for the, for the outcome. The outcome has already been predetermined by God. You just need to deliver and complete your assignment. Amen. You don't have to linger around and wait for the procrastinators and for the naysayers and for those who are legalistic and for those who want to pick apart everything that you are about and everything about your assignment. Hallelujah. So he recognized that by remaining in Judea, he would potentially engage the Pharisees in fruitless debates and conversations that were and would not lead to anywhere. So Jesus took his disciples and they began a journey. He said to the disciples, I got to go to Samaria. Now it's very important to note that Samaria of that time was not a friendly place to Jews. In fact, the Jews despised the Samaritans and the Samaritans equally despised the Jews. Amen. Samaria was a region that was infiltrated by the Assyrian army and the Assyrian empire uh, many years before and had brought in an influx of Gentile settlers to mix and mingle, to co-mingle with the Jews who then populated the region with an unholy breed. So the Samaritans, in the Jews' perspective, were unclean, they were defiled, they were not their equal. Amen? And the Samaritans didn't like the Jews because the Jews had that perspective of them. So it was a mutual hatred, let's say, a disdainful relationship. But yet it's such a weird type of relationship because the Assyrian, the Samaritans, commingled with the Jews and formed this unholy union. Jesus was on assignment. He knew what it was. His first assignment in Judea was completed. 
But he knew of somebody in Samaria who needed him. So although he was heading up to the northeast region of that area, into Galilee, he had to make a bit of a detour into a place called Sikar. Now, scholars and theologians and other biblical brilliant minds refer to Sikar as a place that is also known as end. E-N-D. The end. Sikar is also categorized and classified as the end. Now, I didn't explicate the word far enough to understand truly why Sikar meant the end. But Jesus knew. Amen? Jesus knew that he had to go to Sikar in Samaria to meet somebody who was at their end. Did you get that? Somebody was in Samaria, in Sikar, because they were at their end. So Jesus told the disciples as he was going to Samaria, go get something to eat. Go get us some food. And of course, the disciples, being hungry and being weary themselves, having traveled from Judea up into Samaria and approached Sikar, went to the market and did just that. Hallelujah. So Jesus, after departing from his disciples, went to the well of Jacob. There's an important lesson in that. Jesus himself realized that his next assignment could not involve, did not involve, and would not involve even his disciples, his closest advisors. It couldn't. When God puts a particular assignment upon your life, it often means that there's got to be a pulling away. There's got to be a separation from those who are closest to you. Family, friends, neighbors, husbands, wives. There's got to be a pulling away. And so while Jesus sent them off to go procure a meal for themselves, themselves, notice I said themselves, not for all of them, but for themselves. Jesus knew that he had to do this next assignment alone. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I find it rather peculiar that Jesus would find himself in a place called Sikar and to start something new. The ending of one person's journey birth the starting of their destiny hallelujah the ending of one person's journey birth the beginning the start of their destiny abashinde how many of you in this place today has been at a sakar your wit's end. Sikar. Your dead end. Sikar. The end of the road. Sikar. The end of all hope. Sikar. The end of your marriage. Sikar, the end of your employment. How many of you in this season has experienced Sikar, the end of your COVID government benefits? 
and you wonder, what now, Lord? You see, Jesus knew somebody who was at Sikar. But this woman of Samaria didn't know that Jesus knew that she was at her end. So Jesus went to the, the well of Jacob and he sat around. The Bible said that he was weary because of his journey and that it was about the sixth hour. And in biblical vernacular, that is representative of 12 o'clock noon. And so the sun was hot and it parched the area. And here is this vast pool. The, 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 the pool measured approximately 90 feet across and about 150 feet deep. And it was drying up because of the usage over and over and over the years. For hundreds of years, it was there. Jesus sat at that well waiting for his next assignment. I want you to know today, somebody that is here today, that Jesus is sitting at your well. He's sitting at your cigar. What seemingly is at an end in your life, he wants to bring life to and new beginnings and a fresh start to. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That which was spoken over your life and was declared to be dead and ended at that cigar, Jesus wants to revitalize, restore, renew, and bring forth life. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Enter the woman of Samaria unsuspecting that day that her life was going to forever be changed, she comes up to this well. And it's very interesting to note that in that time, a lot of single men would go to that well because a lot of the ladies of the day would go there also, for the, not only for the purpose of drawing water, but to potentially find a spouse. This lady had five of them. It is not clear if she was going there to seek a sixth. And maybe a seventh or even an eighth thereafter. But what Jesus didn't know was that she needed an encounter with him. Amen. Jesus knowing that this was the custom of the day that young men would go there to find themselves a wife. They would often bring with them on their journey a leather sack. This sack was waterproof. And that, was, that sack was used to be dipped, it was immersed into the water to draw water up from, right? So when this woman came over to the well, and funny enough, so you figure it's a 90-foot radius from where Jesus was sitting and that woman could have been. She could have gone over to the other side, but her destiny pulled her right beside Jesus, Jesus didn't go over to this other side where she was. She was immediately drawn by the power of the, of the, the anointing of God that was in Jesus Christ that was ordained for her in that moment. There was an immediate drawing. There's an immediate pulling. Sometimes we fight against this pulling and the drawing when we know sometimes that God is calling us to do a particular thing and we want to sit on the outskirts of the opposite side from where we know Jesus to be. And we know that we need to be in his presence but sometimes our selfish ways cause us to separate ourselves from the man who is willing to give us a future filled with hope. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This woman's destiny was waiting on the other side of the pool. Her tomorrow was on the other side of her pool. Hallelujah. She was in Sikar. Everything was at an end for her. She kept coming back to that place. So by interpretation, having five husbands, that implies to me that she must have been there at least five other times. Hallelujah. She kept meandering and 
and competing the same circles, repeating the same habits, the same patterns, the same type of lifestyle, she kept finding herself at that very same place. But never before was there a Jesus on the other side of her cigar. So when she got to the well, she went close enough to Jesus on the other side where Jesus said, give me to drink. Give me to drink. Isn't it peculiar that in the socio-political climate of the time that her being a, a Samaritan was still gravitated to this Jew on the other side of the pool? What does that tell you about the divinity of Jesus Christ? His person is magnetic that it will draw even the most unlikeliest individuals to him. Hallelujah. That's all he wants. He comes to draw. He comes to pull. He comes to call. He comes to save, heal, and deliver. Hallelujah. So she says to Jesus, how was it you, a Jew, are asking me, a Samaritan, to give you a drink. <laughs> How was it you, a Jew, ask me, a Samaritan, to give you a drink? <laughs> Hallelujah. She marveled and she wondered. Just that very short exchange caused a stirring in her mind. Jesus answered her in, in verse 10 and said, If you only knew the gift of God. <laughs> Jesus answered and said, If you only knew the gift of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believed it on him shall not perish but have everlasting life. He was the fulfillment of that scripture even in that moment. She did not know in that instance that he was the gift of God. And that's why Jesus said, if you only knew the gift of God and he who asked you to give me the drink, hallelujah, hallelujah, if you only knew and that he would give you living water, by this very exchange, the Samaritan woman immediately discovered that this man was not like any of the others she's met before. There was something different about this man. He didn't try to woo her. He knew everything about her. He didn't try to cause some degree of interest or distraction or the likes or any kind of physical demonstration or didn't try to sweet talk or, hey, uh, you know, come on over here, sweetness, you know, so sit down right here beside me. Let me give you something to drink. <laughs> he didn't know. He knew who she was and what she needed. She looked at him and said, sir, you've got nothing to draw from. Here's the reality of that encounter. Jesus was not there to drink. Remember, he sent his disciples to go get meat. He had to put them aside because this assignment did not involve any of their involvement, any of their activities. So Jesus was neither thirsty, nor was he hungry. Watch this. When the disciples came back, they marveled. They saw Jesus talking to this Samaritan woman. And they were like, Jesus, we got the food. Let's go eat. And Jesus said, no. The meat, the food that I eat is doing my father's will. I got to do his business. I'm on assignment. You eat. You need it. I don't need it. You see, sometimes we want to tell Jesus what he is supposed to do in our season of deliverance. In our season of recovery. 
in our season of hurt. Father, I want you to heal me, but you know what? I really like him. I just love his voice. I love the timbre in his voice. So when he calls me honey, I can't let go of him, Lord. Well, God, you know, uh, she's, she's fine. I love her hair and she does her makeup nicely. She's got those nice lashes on and the, and the, 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 the eyebrows are dead and everything else. I don't know, God, maybe you want to rethink what you're trying to tell me. Hallelujah. 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 Jesus wasn't there to drink, but he was there to dispense water. Only the likes that he could dispense. It wasn't Jacob's well that he was willing to dispense it from. Hallelujah. He broke all social protocols coming after her he knew what it meant to be in the public limelight he knew the pharisees and everybody else around was watching his his every movement and so he wanted to ensure that the mandate the assignment that he was on was completed at that well he knew everything about her but he wasn't concerned about her past I want you to know today, those of you who are here and who are watching on our multimedia platforms, Jesus is not concerned about your past. He knows everything about you. There's nothing about you that you've done or thought, places that you've gone or, you know, conversations that you've entertained that he does not already know. But he's not concerned about that because what he is concerned about is your destiny and your future. And for some, if you continue on your current path of neandering, always coming back to your end to Sikar, you will never achieve your destiny and the charted course for your life that God has already ordained. He is not a God of the mundane. And so it's very important that we encounter and engage Jesus in our time of end. End in your peace. Your children may be causing havoc in your home. You're at your wit's end because you're not getting that phone call for that job that you applied for and the bills are mounting up. You're at your wit's end because you're not feeling any better in your body. You've gone to the specialists over and over. They've given you different medications to try and get you along, but it is a frustrating time because you're not experiencing what God has promised that you would because you haven't engaged him. Hallelujah. You see, sometimes we have to be at our cigar in order for us to realize that we need to go back to that well hallelujah we need to go back to that well so that we can drink of the water that only Jesus Christ himself can give interestingly enough is that and I want for us to really examine what he did by sending his disciples away he cleared his calendar for that Samaritan woman there's somebody here today hallelujah there's somebody here today that the Lord has just completely cleared his calendar for you he wants to encounter you at your cigar the onus is on you now to meet him where he is Hallelujah. You got to meet him where he is. It is here at Sikar that you have to mentally, emotionally, physically, and spiritually separate yourself from the mundane, from the ordinary, from the things that you've been trapped doing year in, year out, day in, day out, night in and night out. 
You see, she kept coming back to this well when Jesus wasn't there in previous instances. She lived a life of repeating the same cycles, doing the same thing over and over and over and over again, expecting a different outcome. That by definition is insanity. We got to stop the insanity. We cannot keep doing the same things over and over and over and over again, thinking that things are going to be different. Hallelujah. We have to stop the meandering. She was tired of being lonely, even though she was married five other times. She was seeking for something that five husbands could not give her. Hallelujah. She was lonely. Her desperation gave birth to her destiny. Hallelujah. Thou hast turned, in, in, in Psalms 30, verse 11 and 12, I'm going to be wrapping up. Thou hast turned for me my mourning into dancing. Thou hast put off my sackcloth and girded me with gladness. To the end that my glory may sing praise to thee and not be silent. O Lord my God, I will give thanks unto thee forever. She no longer remembered why she came to that well. But she received the revelation of who Jesus was. Her disposition changed. In fact, it was that encounter that sparked a revival in that land. <laughs> when Jesus told her, yes, you, are, when, you don't have a husband. In fact, you have five. She mused, well, are you a prophet? And she mused and she took that encounter and she started a revival in that land. Every one of us in this place today and those who are watching on social media, are called to start a revival in our immediate space. God has not done for you the things that he has just so that you can sit on it and meander back over the same habits that you have cultivated over and over again. He has given you an opportunity to change the trajectory of your life by encountering him at your sikar and by encountering him you now then you have the responsibility to engage others so that that revival can start hallelujah you got to it cannot remain in you dormant after experiencing jesus she did not remain at her sikar she did not remain at her end she experienced a revitalization a re rebirthing if you will of her destiny and it became a sense of propelling her into her destiny she went out to the surrounding regions and she said come see a man come see a man we got to get on out in the byways and on the highways. We got to get on our multimedia feeds and tell everybody, come see a man. He tells me all things. I was at my end, but he met me at my cigar. I was at my end. I had no future, but he rearranged and configured my destiny because I was desperate. Hallelujah. Come see a man. Come see a man. See, when Jesus shows up, nothing can stay the same. He brings an end to your end. He brings an end to your end. So regardless of what end you perceive to be at, he's come to end that end. Hallelujah. He's come to end that end. You just got to find him at that well. You got to find him at that well. Hallelujah. In closing, Matthew 11, verse 28, I'm, I'm pressed for time. Jesus said, come on to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And ye shall find rest unto 
your souls, if you're tired, if you're weary, if you're frustrated, if you're confused, won't you come? He was already there waiting. He was waiting for her long before she knew it. He said, come. He said, come. Stop running around. Stop repeating the same cycles. You've, you've tried to do it all by yourself. And it's failed miserably. Jesus said, come. Don't meander. Come to the well. He is waiting for you. He's cleared his schedule for you, his calendar. For those of you who have been to this well before and have left, maybe you became distracted by the ends that have been in your life. I want you to know that Jesus has destined greatness for your life. He knows the thoughts that he has for you. Thoughts to prosper you. To give you a future filled with hope. You don't have to stay at Sikar. There is an end to your end. You just have to come and meet Jesus. He's there waiting. Regardless of what you've done, where you have been, he's a good, good father. He's loving. His great, his grace is sufficient. His love abounds. You can never mess up any more than God knows you are able to. A righteous man sins and he falls seven times but he gets back up again if you feel that you are at your end at your cigar come meet him he's here he's been here he's been waiting won't you engage him won't you come and sit with him for a bit allow for him to tell you who you are not what you want him to think and who you feel you need to be come back to your well come to Sikar put an end to your end and allow your desperation to define your destiny if only you let Jesus do it you can't do it on your own You've tried it and it's failed miserably. I've tried and I have failed miserably. He loves you. Oh, how he loves you. He's jealous for you. <laughs> He'll leave the 99 just for you. In this scripture, in St. John chapter 4, he told his disciples, go. Go because he had you in mind he had you in mind at your cigar at your end he's cleared the calendar for you now you must respond hallelujah 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 and as our musician is playing that in the background I want for every one of us to take a moment and just examine ourselves and see us, see ourselves in the very light that Jesus does. And lay everything down at that well, just as that woman did. She came with her containers, her pails, her baskets, the familiar implements that she used to draw back and draw from that well. She left them there. And she embraced and experienced the love of Jesus Christ who gave her the water that she so needed that she's never had before. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Is 
there anybody here in this place, maybe on social media, maybe on the Zoom call, right where you are, who needs to experience Jesus for themselves, who needs to come to that well? He's waiting. He's been waiting. He's got you in mind. He cleared his calendar for you. Don't let this moment pass. Don't let it pass. He's got you in mind. He came to save. He came to heal. He came to deliver. He came to restore. If you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, will you do it now? Will you do it now? He loves you. You are so precious in his sight. You could have never done anything that will cause the love of God to stop flowing to you. You are the apple of his eye. Which is why he purposed to meet you at your cigar, at your end. His grace is sufficient. His mercy is from everlasting to everlasting. He wants to heal and restore you. Turn your desperation into destiny so that you can experience the abundance of his love. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.